Hey, y'all. We are back for a new series. It's so crazy. The last series, I was about seven or eight months pregnant. And here we are. My daughter's in the background. You might hear her. And she is seven months old uh, at the time of this filming. And it's just such a full circle moment. I'm so blessed to be doing this. You know, sometime around last year, I had an encounter and the Lord had shown me to do a series on marriage. Now, um, as you already know, this is called Before I Do, the biblical blueprint for love and marriage. I believe this is gonna help so many people who have a desire for marriage to understand what marriage is really all about from a biblical perspective. And even those that are married, I believe there's gonna be so much value in this for you. And so let's get on this journey. This is going to be a seven part series, and I'm really excited about what God is going to do with it. And so here we are, part one, and part one is about what is marriage. <laughs> so, and I really want to, part one, I really want to go into the text of this, like the teaching of this. And so not too much of, you know, I like to add my stories here and there, but what is going to be more powerful for you is the word of God, because, you know, everyone is going to have different perspectives, different life experiences, but the word of God is our standard. And so what is marriage? Here's the first thing. I would start off by saying what marriage is not, so we better understand what marriage is. Now, the first thing is marriage is not an event, right? I know when you are thinking about marriage, the first thing most people think about <laughs> is their wedding. Their wedding is the first thing. Marriage is not an event. Marriage is not a wedding. You can have a glamorous wedding and a failed marriage. So you cannot make the marriage about the wedding because here is the thing. You have your expectation of what you are, what you desire. And if you make the marriage about an event, what if you meet, you know, you meet the, the man you're going to marry and he's not in a place financially to cater to that. Now that becomes a place, an open door for the enemy to step in to cause resentment and bitterness right? You don't want to go in depth just because you want to have a successful wedding, but now a failed marriage. It doesn't work that way. If you both are in a place that you can have an ex and a beautiful wedding, an elaborate wedding, go for it, right? But marriage is not an event. So I want to start by, you know, encouraging you to go at your own pace. The wedding is an event, but marriage is a journey. And so whatever that could look like for you, keep an open mind. Don't just make it about what you desire, how you want to look, where you want the venue to be. There are women, you know, and some men who plan out their, their wedding ever before they meet their spouse. And it becomes an open door for the enemy to say, oh, I can use you. I can use this to keep you bound. I can use this to, to cause bitterness. I can use this to cause hate, right? Marriage is not an event. Number two, marriage is not a contract. Now, marriage can be defined in modern day as a legal institution recognized by the state, right? Your marriage certificate is acknowledged by the government as a legally binding contract. Now, I I'm going to speak on this because as a disclaimer, I am not against you having a marriage certificate right? I have a marriage certificate. I believe that the certificates, um, they have international recognition. Um, when you are, when the state recognizes your marriage, there are benefits for that, right? But many people are also afraid of getting married because of that, because you might hear some people feeling as though, oh, I'm getting married to the state. This is a contract. And the fear is, the cost, the literal <laughs> cost of divorce, <laughs> because when the state is involved and if the marriage doesn't work out and the couple gets divorced, especially wherever you might be watching this in the U S for example, in California, for example, divorce can be expensive depending on where you both are in your financial lives. Right. But I'm not, I'm, I'm, I'm sharing this to just lay a foundation that yes, the state can be involved and all of that, but that should not be a hindrance because it's only a hindrance when you view marriage as a contract. 
but it should not be a hindrance. Yes, the state can be involved. You might not have a prenup or all these things, or you might have a prenup, whatever you, whatever floats your boat, but it only becomes a problem if you're coming into the marriage, seeing it as a contract. It's not a contract, right? A contract is a conditional agreement that is between two individuals. And here's the problem with it. Because the moment one party says, hey, you know, when something is conditional, that means I'm going into it with the idea that you have to meet my needs. You have to, you know, this is my expectation. This is what I desire. The moment you don't meet that need, I'm out. That's conditional. Contracts are conditional. I'm going into this with a perceived idea of what I want to get out from it. The moment I don't get that, I'm out. But marriage is not a contract, right? A contract mentality. My husband and I, we always have this, um, we talk, we talk about this open door analogy. If there's fire in the house, if the doors are open, right? <laughs> My daughter's having a great time. Now, if there's fire in the house, if the doors are open, what's the first thing you're gonna do? You're gonna run. If the doors are open, you are going to run out the house. That would be your first natural instinct is to run. But if there's fire in the house and the doors are locked, the windows are locked, your first instinct is to get the fire out. Your first instinct is to look in the house to see how you can get the fire under control because there's no way out. Now, a contract mentality is the open door mentality. The doors are open. The moment there is something that, you know, I'm not comfortable with, I am out of this place. A covenant mentality is there's a fire in the house. The windows are shut. The doors are locked. We need to figure out how to get this fire under control. We need to handle this. That's a covenant mentality. So now what is marriage? Marriage is a God-ordained institution. It is the oldest institution ordained by God. Now let's read the scripture together. Genesis 2, 21 to 25, it says, And the Lord God caused a deep sleep to fall on Adam, and he slept, and he took one of his ribs and closed up, in, closed up flesh in its place. Then the rib which the Lord God had taken from man he made into a woman and he brought her to the man. And Adam said, this is now bone of my bones and flesh of my flesh. Now I want you to pay attention to when Adam says, this is now, this is now, we're going to get back to that. She shall be called woman because she was taken out of man. Therefore, a man shall leave his father and mother and be joined to his wife. That's another key place. All along, Eve is called woman. But the moment the man leaves his father and mother and is joined to his wife, not just joined within proximity of space, but this is also a place of sexual intimacy. Now she goes from being called woman to wife right? And we're going to talk about that now. And they shall become one flesh, right? They shall become one flesh. It's a process to become one with your spouse. And they were both naked, the man and his wife, not just the man, check this out, not just the man and the woman. Now it's the man and his wife. And they were not ashamed. Now, in the beginning, there were no certificates to, you know, bind the marriage, right? This was, it, it, it was always presented as that which is spiritual, right? Before God, because the Lord, it is his institution. Now, due to the fallen state of man, certificates had to be introduced because here's the beauty of what took place, even with Adam. And as we look at what happens on the day you get married, whether it's a glamorous wedding, whether it's in a court, whatever it looks like, is there is a moment of declaration, right? A certificate acknowledges the day that you made this vow to your spouse. There is a moment where you are declaring that just like Adam said, but look at this, he said, this is now, 
bone of my bones and flesh of my flesh. It was a moment of declaring that as I'm looking at the woman, this is now my wife. This is now bone of my bone and flesh of my flesh. In the same way that I will not separate my bone from its bone or my flesh from its flesh, I will not separate from her. Now, what happens even with a certificate is you have a moment of declaration that on this day, I am making this vow and commitment to this person. And guess what? It was not just your family that heard it. It was not just the priest that heard it. God heard it and he honors it. He honors that vow and that promise that you made to that individual. Now, you might be wondering, like, where was Eve's consent, right? But when you look at this scripture in Genesis 2, it gives us this blueprint of God's model, right? You see where Adam first acknowledges the man is the one, you know, asking the woman for her hand in marriage. There's a recognition that now this is bone of my bone, flesh of my flesh. There's a declaration of the moment he recognizes this is what it is. And then when it says, now he shall leave his father and mother, this is Adam and Eve. They didn't have a father or a mother. They're in the garden with God. But the Lord is giving us the blueprint and he shall be joined to his wife, right? So it's now him embracing that this would be my new family. I'm not no longer, of course, you're going to have your father, your mother, and all of that beautiful, you know, uh, um, connection with family, but he's embracing now my wife is going to be one with me. I'm not bringing them into this. My father and mother cannot be one with my wife. They're going to be her in-laws and it's going to be beautiful. But now I'm seeing that I have a new family that I am responsible to steward, right? This is a responsibility in my life that has to have priority. And it says, and he shall be joined to his wife. That joining has to happen with agreement. So the man acknowledges and the woman accepts, right? This is now bone of my bone, flesh of my flesh. And that is also the beauty. The, the reason, like I said earlier, why you know certificates and all these things have to be introduced is the fallen nature of man. If we don't have these things in place, then people will begin to cohabitate. And we'll talk about that very soon, but cohabitation is not marriage, right? But in these times, there was such a purity in that declaration. This is before sin entered the world. So when Adam is making this declaration and they become one where sexual intimacy is also involved, boom, Eve goes from being called woman to wife right? Because it was such a purity of heart and the Lord honors that. You see, wherever you get married, wherever you have a moment of declaration, whether it's in front of your family and friends, whether it's in front of a priest, it's in front of a judge, whatever, you know, that looks like the moment you make a declaration, a vow, a commitment that I say yes to you, I'm saying I do before God and man. You have to recognize that God is watching and he honors that because marriage was not your idea. Marriage is not our idea. Marriage is God's idea. So when we talk about marriage as a covenant, right, it is both conditional and unconditional. Now, as a covenant, it is a spiritual binding agreement right? When you look at marriage from a contract perspective, it's a natural legal binding agreement. But marriage as a covenant is spiritually binding because guess what? It's God's idea. It's not your idea. It's not my idea. It's God's idea. And whenever you make a vow, a commitment to a person in such a, in, 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 with such a weighty um, statement of your joining to them, you're saying, yes, I do to marry you. And the other person is in agreement and they're responding. God gets involved right? And so in that, it is conditional and unconditional. Now, unconditional in how God ordained it. 
how he ordained us to love our spouses. Conditional because there is a standard he calls us to abide to. There are terms that he has set in order for us to receive the blessings connected to marriage right? Now, before we go into that, you have to realize that marriage is not something that you just see what happens, right? There are times where maybe, you know, pregnancy is involved and it's like, hey, a baby is coming. Let's just see what happens. Or, you know, maybe you've been dating for a couple of years and it's like, okay, we've been dating all this time. Let's just see what happens. You have to realize what marriage is. It's a covenant. And there is a standard that God requires how the man should treat the woman and how the woman should treat the man, right? And when that standard, when you abide by that standard, there are blessings that are that you receive. Now, first of all, this is not to condemn anyone who has been through a divorce right? I have people very close to me, people I love, people I admire that have been divorced. But you have to understand that in the mercy and in the goodness of God, in how he dealt with that situation does not change his standard. People should never be your standard right? No matter what it is, especially when you're dealing with something that is a word from the Lord, that is something that is instituted by God. People are not your standard. God should always be your standard, right? That's why you also, you always have to know how to separate when there is a case that is, you know, that is marked by God's mercy versus how he calls you to live two separate things Two, you both are two different individuals, right? So you cannot make a person your standard. So now let's look at um, Malachi 2 verse 10 to 14, as it relates to marriage as a covenant. Now the scripture says, have we not all one father? Has not one God created us? Why do we deal treacherously with one another by profaning the covenant of the fathers? Judah has dealt treacherously and an abomination has been committed in Israel and in Jerusalem. For Judah has profaned the Lord's holy institution, which he loves. He has married the daughter of a foreign God. Look at that. They're talking about marriage, first of all, as the Lord's holy institution, which he loves. God is for marriage. God loves marriage. And in part two, we're going to go deeper into why. What is the purpose of marriage, right? And then it says, may the Lord God cut off from the tents of Jacob, the man who does this, being awake and aware, yet who brings an offering to the Lord of hosts. And this is the second thing you do. You covered the altar of the Lord with tears, with weeping, and crying so he does not regard the offering anymore nor nor receive it with goodwill from your hands and check this out yet you say for what reason because the lord has been a witness between you and the wife of your youth whom with whom you have dealt treacherously yet she is your companion and then hear this part and your wife by covenant. She is your wife. Yes, she is your companion, but she is also your wife by covenant. Now, earlier I talked about how there is marriage is in, you know, as a covenant is conditional and unconditional, right? The conditions there is there is a way, and we're going to unpack this. First of all, understand this is a seven part series, right? So you, you're you going to flow with me in the rhythm. There's a lot that we have to unpack in this series as it relates to marriage. But when we talk about it is a covenant and it there are terms, terms connected to it. Do you realize that biblically, for example, when a man deals treacherously, when a man is, um, you know, it, it treats his wife in a way that see, that the Lord looks upon as wicked. Do you know that he literally tells that he says concerning such a person that your prayers will be hindered. 
You see the conditions that as a husband, if you treat your wife in a way that causes her to be in bitterness, that causes her to cry out to God against you, that causes her to have sorrow because of you, the Lord literally says that your prayers would be hindered. He does not, he would not even hear it. Look at that. It's in first Peter three, seven right? And you can study that. But it literally says, husbands, likewise, dwell with them with understanding, giving honor to your wife as the weaker vessel. And we're going to talk about what being the weaker vessel really means. It's not what, the, you know, um, some, some church culture has made it to be, right? As being heirs together of the grace of life that your prayers may not be hindered. That if you dishonor her, it will be hindered, literally. So you see their terms. So marriage is not something you just go into to see what happens. Because if you go into just to see what happens and you start to mistreat one another, now with the man, for example, if you're just like, oh, let's see what happens. She got pregnant. Let's just see what happens. And you don't prepare yourself in the word of God to know what this is about. You would begin to think your wife is the reason doors are not opening for you. This is when people start looking as their partner, as the enemy to their breakthrough, the enemy to their blessing. Oh, I got married and everything just, uh, it's almost, you start feeling like things just started closing on you, closing on you, closing on you. But the reality is you got married and you never let go of your selfish ways. You got married and you dishonored your wife. You got married. You took this person. You know, you said, I do to this person. You were like, okay, let's become one. And you dishonored your wife. So where you had grace, it lifted. Because the Lord is now looking at you and says, wait, you dishonored her. You're dishonoring her. My ears are shut to you. She is not the problem. How you treat her is the enemy. The selfishness is the enemy. The pride, the ego is the enemy. And if you don't realize that, you begin to think your wife is the problem, right? So there are standards that God has set concerning marriage. Now, the, the Bible also said that it is a holy institution Marriage, I will say this again, because you have to understand this. Marriage is God's idea. Marriage is God's institution, right? It's not just because you got hype on emotions. When you, when you make a commitment, make, when you make a vow, when you make a declaration, do you know that the Bible talks about that you will be judged for every empty word? You don't make vows just randomly. That's the difference between now, you know, um, um, then and now. I mean, I mean, now and then, rather. In the beginning, when Adam said, this is now bone of my bones and flesh of my flesh, he meant that thing. Even after Eve, you know, ate the, the fruit, gave him some, and he had a moment of fate when he's like, the woman you gave me, he never asked to be separated from her. He made that commitment. He made that vow. God honored it. Today, that looks like that moment of declaration. It's not that when you're engaged because you're, you're just kind of setting the tone. You're saying, this is what I want to do. I would love for us to, would you marry me? But that day when you make that declaration, you sign that document and there is a date. That's why we have wedding anniversary or a marriage anniversary because there is a day just like Adam said, now this is bone of my bone. There is a now that you have in marriage. There is a now that I have concerning my husband and I. There is a day that we made vows to each other and God honors it. But not only does he honor it, there are standards that he set in place concerning that, right? You have to understand that marriage is a covering. The context of a covenant is that a covenant is a covering. 
And I love it. Dr. Tony Evans has this um, example analogy when he talks about how marriage is like an umbrella that brings protection, right? It brings a covering. Now, what does this look like? Um, 1 Corinthians 11, 13, 11 verse 3 says, but I would have you know that the head of every man is Christ and the head of the woman is the man and the head of Christ is God, right? What is it speaking to a covering? It's speaking in the context of marriage, it's speaking to a covering. The head of every woman is the man, is her husband, and the head of the husband is Christ and the head of Christ is God. And what is it also speaking to? Order. We're going to talk more about this when we talk about who is a biblical husband, who is a biblical wife, to recognize the posture and who God has called us to be in the marriage as a woman, as a man. It speaks to the order of God and it speaks to the flow of covering. And you see, wherever there is order, there is a blessing. Wherever you align with the order of God, there is a blessing. There is a reward. Now, when you think about covering, here is, here is something that is so key. Where there is a covering, there is expanded capacity. Because before you were married, right, as a single person, you are covered. You have, you are, God, the Lord is your covering, right? When you get married, there's a new covering. Your husband also be, is now your covering. And then the Christ is his covering. But whenever there is a new covering introduced, your capacity increases. This is, a, this is the mystery of marriage that we're going to talk more into when we go into the purpose of marriage. Because when your capacity increases, it reveals the reason why it says that when a man finds a woman, he, when a man finds a wife, he obtains favor from the Lord. Favor is the evidence of assignment. Favor is not just for the sake of favor. Favor opens doors right? When there is favor on a person, then what would have been difficult becomes easy. When there is favor on a person, your names is not, your, your, your name is being talked about in rooms that you have not even walked into. So when you step into marriage, it increases your capacity. There are new assignments that the Lord begins to give you because there is a new covering and that covering means that there is something that it is tailored to do within your heart, within your mind, that allows God to increase your capacity, right? And you're gonna, we're gonna talk more on this when we, when we really hit the purpose of marriage. I can't wait for part two. It is going to be, oh my gosh, <laughs> but a covering, right? Now look at this. Um, I don't know if you guys have heard about um this pastor James Koala. Um, when he shared, and if you haven't, I'm going to put the link in the description, but he talks about his story, you know, coming out of witchcraft and, you know, now becoming a pastor. And one of the things he said is whenever, you know, the witches want to attack a, a person in ministry, when they want to attack someone who is doing some mighty things for the kingdom of God, if they are married, the first thing they strike is their marriage. And he literally says the reason is to attack the covering of the marriage, to attack that covering. So where there is a covering, there is expanded capacity, right? Now, before we get into all that, because, you know, a lot of this is really when we get into the purpose of marriage, but what a covenant is not. Earlier, I talked about cohabitation. And this is so important because even when I was doing research, I realized that cohabitation, I mean, it has just, it is increasing while we're seeing, at the same time, while we're seeing marriages failing, right? And many people, and people have their different reasons. Some people will say like, hey, you know, it's, we save on rent or whatever. But at the end of the day, when your mind is determined to do things the right way, you would find a way. OK, if you're saving on rent, you could also have a different kind of roommate. You could get a roommate with, you know, somewhere else. But whatever the case might be, you have to understand that cohabitation is not marriage. It is convenient 
but it is not marriage. And one of the key reasons is that co there is no moment of declaration with cohabitation. You're just living together. You're just enjoying each, each other's company. You're shacking up, <laughs> you know. Um, you oh, it's an open door, literally, for the enemy, because oftentimes, you know, even when sex is involved, it clouds your it it, it clouds your judgment. So now you could be cohabitating with someone who is literally just wasting your time, right? And there are cases that it does get into marriage, but even when it does get into marriage, there, there are things that you have to really work out that may feel harder than if you were not cohabitating, right? And so cohabitation, it is not marriage. I want to encourage anyone listening to this. If you are living with your boyfriend, your girlfriend, your fiance, you know, what have you, you can have the intention to marry that person, but do it right. What you're, 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 you're putting yourself, you know, in a daily position for being tempted and you need to see clearly before you get married, you, you need the fog cleared. You need to understand what you're really stepping into. It will save you time. It will save you time of argument. It will save you so much. Do it right. Do it right. Maybe no one has told you that's why you're just cohabitating. And let me be the voice to you to say, if you truly love this person, if you truly see a future with this person, do it right. Because when we get into part two, the purpose of marriage, there is a quote by Miles Monroe. He says, when the purpose of a thing is not known, abuse is inevitable. You need to get to a place where you both as individuals understand the purpose of marriage because it would be healthier. It will save you time. Right. And when I talk about save you time, it will save you time of bickering, of unnecessary arguments because you both were coming into it healthy. Now, in the scripture I shared, when the Lord talks about how, you know, they they married, you know, a woman, a foreign God and all these things. Um, now, if you are married to an unbeliever, that doesn't mean it's grounds for divorce, right? If you're already married, you might be watching this, you're already married. We're going to talk more about that, right? If you got married in, and the situation was not the best. Now, like I said, the primary reason that I'm having this series is to also help and educate young people, you know, old people, wherever you fall in the age group that are looking to get married and to help you to understand what marriage is so that you can redeem time. So that you don't fall into something and you're like, wait, what is this? How, how did I get here? I don't think it's for me, X, Y, and Z. No. And if you're married, I believe this is also going to bless you because as we go into this even further, as we unpack this further, you're going to see areas where you will see, oh, maybe I need to tweak how I'm doing this here. Maybe I need to tweak this or tweak that. It's not about shame or guilt or, man, I wish I knew this before I got married. You're here now, right? And so wherever you are, jump right in and let's lay the foundation. Let's lay a biblical foundation that you can build your marriage on or you know, in some cases, whatever you built it on, if it's not God, that you can now invite him into that mix, right? And do it his way. So I'm excited for this. I'll see you next week for part two. Um, as this was, this part one was really just to lay the foundation of what marriage is. Marriage is a covenant. It is not a cohab, it's not cohabitation. It's not an event. It's not a contract. It's a covenant. It's God's holy institution that he loves. It's God's idea, not our idea. And because it's his idea, we have to do it his way. I'll see you next week when we talk about the purpose of marriage.